Well, I want to say welcome to everyone on the call. I'm Becky Binder with Cornet Global. Um, we're very pleased to have you participate in today's webinar. And briefly, what we'll go through are just, I'll be going through a few things that are new about the summit, and then um, I'll turn you over to Margo because she's really got uh, the bulk of this time together with you. So next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we have just a few quick facts. We're expecting around 500 or more delegates. Um, I know there will be more than 80 speakers, lots of sessions going on. Something new that you're probably not aware of, uh, for the first time we'll be, have the capability to record podcasts. So anyone coming to the summit could sit down, make some time, and record a podcast. So if you know of someone that you'd like to interview or you have an idea for a podcast, just, you know, think about that in advance and then um, you'll be, if you'd like to do so, you can do that while on site. Um, this year, there'll be the academic challenge, which is the top teams that are participating in the challenge. They'll be um, holding their competition there. And so that's the academic challenge 3.0. That'll be on the 15th. So you could hear from some of the top student teams. And then Future Forward is Cornet Global's um, new initiative to take a look at what is the association model of the future. So just some different things going on um, throughout the summit. Okay, and it sounds like we have somebody who's talking to the children in the background. If you could just mute your microphone, please, and, and join us. Okay, so next slide. We're doing something different this year that I think is going to be a big improvement for, uh, for the speakers and for staff who, like myself. So what we're doing is, in, in the past, you would have had to bring uh, a, your laptop and we would have asked you in advance for your presentation for our Knowledge Center Online. That was always a bit problematic, um, sometimes, uh, File size transfers were large and it was hard to get the files through. There were times when there were problems with laptops. So this time we're working very closely with our AV team and you'll hear me call them Freeman, it's Freeman AV. And they'll be contacting you to send you a login and a password. So what you can do is in advance of the summit, once you've got your login and password, in advance of the summit, you can send them your file or plan to go on site up to two hours before your presentation to meet with the AV team. They're going to load that up for you and then when you walk into the room at, at the time of your presentation, there'll be a computer in the room with your name on it. You'll just click on that. Your presentation will be there. If you have any issues during the presentation, there's a, a red help button and you click that and they're going to know that you're having a problem and they'll be over to help you quickly. So uh, we're anticipating that this will be much smoother. I just wanted to give you the heads up to please think about when you're on site, you're going to need to plan some time to get over to the speaker ready room, meet with the technician, and just ensure that everything is the way you want it on your presentation. But the beauty of it is, is once you're, once you've, even if you put your presentation up and, you know, five days ahead of time, if you thought of something you'd want to change it, you can still change it after it's been uploaded. So we think this will be a lot, lot better. Um, and all reports from other organizations who have taken this step they're really glad they did, and um, there's no going backwards. It's just made everybody's life simpler. Next slide. The other thing that's different uh, AV-wise is that in the past, like I said, you had your presentation file, you sent it to us, we put it on the Knowledge 
center online and it was shared uh, with members who wanted to, to, to be able to view it and see it. So this time what happens is when Freeman has your file, you, at that point, you don't need to send anything to us for the Knowledge Center. They'll have all those files. They'll be able to upload that to Cornet Global. The change that I think is going to make a difference as far as um, for the people who are going to be um, following along afterwards is that your file will have the audio part recorded. So instead of it, the person who's going to the Knowledge Center and they're seeing, just seeing PowerPoint, sometimes you can get the real story from the PowerPoint and other times you, you're not, you're, you don't hear all the story because you've missed some of those nuances and, and good things that happen in the dialogue. So the record, there'll be the, the audio recording with the PowerPoint presentation. So we think that'll make a better, definitely a better learning experience. So that's a, that's a change there. Um, and the next slide. So what to expect? Expect some emails because we know that this is a change. We have not done this before. Um, so you'll get a, a speaker know before you go email from us probably early next week. That goes to everyone and has a lot of details in it. And then if you're the primary speaker, and by that, I mean the person who submitted a proposal and then is inviting other co-speakers. Peter, Andrew, you're an example of that. You're a prime, what we call a primary speaker. So you'll be getting an email that talks a little bit more about this presentation management. And the main thing here, I think my key point is that once you get that, then there's going to be an email from Freeman directly to you. So please watch for an email from Freeman because that has the information for your login and password. So there's that sequence of three emails to expect. Next slide. And then on our summit app, if you would download that the app in advance of the summit, that's where you can create your schedule. That's where we'd like to have you uh, point out to the, the delegates that there's the evaluation function. Okay. Now we really need to take action on the You hear piano playing in the background. Whoever has a piano in their house, we're going to do it. Okay, so Margo, that's up. Next slide. Okay. <laughs> oh, I and so at this point, I'd like to turn this over to Margo. I had the pleasure of working with Margo in Berlin about five years ago. She did a series of presentations on how to be a more effective communicator. The rooms were packed every single time. She's terrific. I'm really glad that you, everyone, has the opportunity to meet Margo and. Um, she'll be going through how to connect with your audience. So, Margo, over to you. That's great. And Becky, I see Peter has a question to you before I start in the chat box. I don't know if you can see that. Type away or ask away, Peter. Okay. Thank you. So here we go, unmute. Ah, Becky Heal needs to be unmuted. I don't think I have that ability on my end. Okay. I'm not sure how Becky, do you manage to unmute him? Yeah, I just got to the screen. Okay, I think I just managed to unmute myself by clicking on something. Can you hear me? Yeah. Great, Peter. Okay. <laughs> I clicked enough buttons on the screen until I unmuted. Uh, a quick question. Uh, Becky, our session has only two or three slides. It's mostly a panel discussion, but I'd really like to be able to you know, interact with the audience. Does the app come with a question um, platform that we can be taking live questions, or do we need to provide our own one if we want to run that? Um, 
It has functionality for polling and it has functionality for uh, for the question part as well, where people can sort of vote on a question and, and it pushes it up and down on, okay. on there. It can send in, yep. Perfect, that's all I need to know, thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much, Becky, also for the introduction. It's my pleasure to be able to have this webinar with you guys today. Um, what I heard from those of you who responded to our survey is the most important thing is how to keep engagement. So one thing I'm gonna, I'm gonna role model to you now is one thing you can do to make sure that your people are still with you and check ask them, ask them to talk about how they wanna work together. So I apologize, I had a little bit of a delay here on my keynote. You should see a question on your screen. How would you like to work together? So what I'd love for you to do, those of you who can find the chat box, I know not everybody seems to be able to access it, just think about what agreements you want people to make in order to get the most out of this webinar. You're going to invest the next 45 minutes of your life looking into your computer, hoping to get a good takeaway, and what do you want people to agree to do in order to get most out of this. One thing would be to be in a quiet room, for example, if possible. <laughs> um, or mute the button. I hear you need some more volume. Is that better, Peter? I hope that's... Uh, I'll do my best. Okay, great. I'll do my best to speak loudly and then move forward. information that you're not seeing on the Great. So if you can hear me, I know I know Peter's there. Let me know if the rest of you guys are there. And think about what is it that you need to get the most out of this? What do you need from each other as participants? Now, I'm role modeling this here on this webinar. Thank you, Megan, she can hear us. Um, yeah, do, send your chat to everyone. Make sure that everybody sees. The kind of things that come up if you do something like this in a live presentation are people say, okay, we want to make sure we interact, we want to make sure that when people ask questions, that we're not too shy, or maybe if it's a more personal nature, they want to hold things confidential. Um, the comment, as much as I love Star Wars, whoever contributed the soundtrack, perhaps keep an eye on the mute button, right? So all I'm doing here is saying, let's think about what we want to do to get the most out of this, and I'm asking you a question to help, help you become more focused on what we're about to do. The biggest request that I would have as far as how we want to work together is single tasking. I know it's tempting. I'm sure a lot of you have your emails open and you're busy people. Uh, Peter had seven back-to-back -back calls he wrote in the, in the chat. I'm sure there's a lot of follow-up work. But as long as you're taking the time to be here, be fully here, not only to get the most out of this webinar, but also to do your best at whatever those other tasks are later. Can we agree to that? Let's see some yeses. Thank you, Megan. Yes is in the text box. Go ahead and use the chat box. So, <laughs> thank you, Tika. This is um, planning and managing time as well as slide deck presentation tools. Yeah, great. Thank you for the responses that are coming in. What I'm doing here is speaking to a group of people who I'm sure are already very experienced presenters. And I, what I hope is you can take away a few tips that things that you might not have tried before. And I would like to go into some concepts and some concrete tips. So one of those things is just, yeah, getting people to agree on how they're gonna be in the webinar. And that's something you might do in real life. Obviously, when you're at the Cornet Summit, thank goodness you're gonna have the people in front of you. You're gonna get instant feedback. Are people listening or are they not listening? I don't have that luxury today. So I'm just gonna assume that you're here with me and otherwise that would be harder to keep your attention. So three main points, three main areas that I'm going to cover. The principles of connection, what keeps people connected and interested. I'm going to talk about what tools you have available. And I'm going to spend a few minutes discussing how to manage those difficult questions when you feel a little bit uh, like a deer in the headlights in front of the room. So at any time, please feel free to write questions or comments in the chat box. I'm going to do my best to keep an eye on those. And I'm going to move quite quickly. In real life, if we were together, I would give a lot more time for interaction and pausing because that is one of the best ways to keep engagement. So, principles of connection. How to stay connected with your audience. Here's the most important theme 
that we're going to cover, and that's about your audience's filters. So I want to I want to paint a picture for you of what happens to your audience. And now's the time to close your laptop or your not not the laptop that you're using. Close any multitasking device you have. Close your iPhones and pay attention because this is the most important piece. So what I just did now when I said close those other things is I hopefully got your filter down. All audiences are constantly raising a filter that blocks out what you're saying to them. Picture eight. An automatic door, you know, those, you walk into a store and push the door open and that door has an automatic hinge to reclose itself. That's kind of what the human brain does when it's sitting in a presentation. So the person may be listening, they may have the best intentions to listen, but it's very hard for the brain to pay attention constantly for an hour. The brain wants to wander off. That's because it's efficient. It's trying to save energy. It's just saying, okay, I need to take in as little as possible to retake it, pay as little attention as possible to get the most out of it. Another way to raise filters is by silence. I hope that pausing just now caused any of you who had wandered off to come back. Why did she pause? That's a little trick. So there's lots and lots of ways to keep those filters on. And what I would do, what I would love to do if we had more time, is to hear from you. Like I said, I'm sure you're all experienced presenters to share some ideas about what are those things that keep filters down, what are those little tricks that you do to keep filters down. I have four main categories of things that help keeping those filters down that I'm going to go through. <clears throat> so just if you do have some quick ideas in the chat box, what are some of those little things that you do? Let's see how fast you can be on the keyboard. I'm asking for interaction again, hopefully lowering your filter. Let's see what comes in. Very good. Start with a video or loud music. Play with your volume. Yeah, speaking quietly, maybe that gets people to lean in. And then speaking loudly to make it a point. <laughs> Turn the lights off. Right. Sure, why not? Whatever it takes just to wake people's brains up again. This is great. Asking questions, saying names. You know, I have a luxury of having the list of participants. I haven't heard from you yet, Heather. I have Abel on the phone. I haven't heard from, that, from you yet, Abel. Things like getting people's attention, saying their name, surprising them, doing something unexpected. One of the things that I do often is when I notice the energy in the room going down, I give them a chance to chat about what they just discussed. Let people talk. It gets boring to have to listen all the time. And especially if you're an extroverted person, you like to talk in order to understand things. So help people remember what you're saying by letting them chat about it. I have a whole list of things that I'm going to put in the presentation that you'll get afterwards, a list of tips to lowering the filters so you will receive that. I'm going to keep moving. Um, all right. So David mentioned I move on stage before I make an important, an important point. Great. So the actual movement can be helpful. You can play with the space that you have. So the four principles of connection that I'm going to talk about are the fact that our brain thinks in emotions and pictures. That's how the brain works. We don't remember uh, the words in a paragraph. We remember how we feel. We, we remember pictures. Another principle to connect with people is this interaction, keeping the interaction going. Now, in a virtual session like this, of course, that's extremely challenging. But when you have people right in front of you, you have all sorts of opportunities to interact. That brings people's filters down. Having confidence and humor really helps. People are much more willing to leave that door open for somebody who seems interesting, who maybe tells a joke, who, who gets your brain thinking in a different way. And of course, personal stories. People, when they hear a whole load of data, their brain starts to shut down. When all of a sudden you tell a story about how that data impacted you or what's going to be possible once that you have the data, it becomes much more interesting, filters go down. So first thing I'm going to talk about is the personal story. Now, I hope you might have noticed that that was a different order. I started with the very last one, which is a little surprising. You would have thought that I'm going to go ahead and start with the, the first one, the pictures and emotions, because that was the top of the list. That's one little tip, one little trick, just to surprise people. Why? Not just because you want to surprise them, but because it's, it's unusual, it's unexpected, and people think, oh, my brain better not relax too much because there's going to be unexpected stuff coming. I'm going to pay more attention. All these little things you can do to get people to pay attention again are going to help you. 
So why do personal stories help? It's because people don't remember what you said, they remember how you made them feel. Did you feel good? Did you feel sad? Did you feel connected with the emotion? And that's why we also have to connect our own emotions if we're telling a story. And I want to give you a great example. Here we go, Oprah Winfrey. Some of you may have seen her recently at the Golden Globes. In 1954, I was a little girl sitting on the linoleum floor of my mother's house in Milwaukee, watching Anne Bancroft present the Oscar for Best Actor at the 36th Academy Awards. She opened the envelope and said five words that literally made history. The winner is Sidney Poitier. Up to the stage came the most elegant man I have ever seen. I remember his tie was white and of course his skin was black and I've never seen a black man being celebrated like that. And I tried many, many, many times to explain what a moment like that means to a little girl, a kid watching from the cheap seats, as my mom came through the door, bone tired from cleaning other people's houses. But all I can do is quote and say that the explanation in Sydney's performance in Lilies of the Field, amen, 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 amen. In 1982, Sydney received the Sister Lee to Know Award right here at the Golden Globe. And it is not lost on me that at this moment, there are some little girls watching as I become the first black woman to be given the same award. Okay, so what did you notice about this story? What was most memorable and stands out to you? Quickly in the chat box, enter. What's memorable here? See what you come up with. For me, the most important thing was, oh, it was hard to hear. Oh, I apologize. I hope it wasn't so hard to hear that you couldn't get much from it. If you get a chance to watch this clip again, if you look up Oprah Winfrey at the Golden Globe, you'll hear her talk about her sitting on the linoleum floor while she watched, yeah, it's a personal story, while she watched the Golden Globes when she was a child. She talked about her mother walking in bone tired after a day cleaning other people's houses. So it's exactly, the, the description helps you put yourself in Oprah's position. You could really feel yourself there because the details were there. She invoked not only emotion of hope and, and, and awe, but she also described what things felt like. You know, you could just picture the feeling of this hard linoleum floor. She didn't give a whole context of why her mother was cleaning house. She just said what was happening right then in that moment. Not too many words, but very descriptive. So that's a really nice tip when you're thinking about, I want to share a personal story, rehearse it in front of people, ask them which words can I get rid of, what parts of the story can I get rid of, and how can I describe all the five senses, things that are going on in this story, that gets your point across. So I'm, time is of the essence, so I'm going to keep moving, but I wanted to give you that as a great example of storytelling. <laughs> So emotions and pictures, right? So we picture that linoleum floor, we can picture that kitchen, we can feel the emotion that Oprah has, the pride that she has right now when she was telling the story, but also the hope and the, the amazement she felt back then when she was a child. And just having some simple pictures visible on your screen can also be very memorable. That's an important aspect too that we're gonna go into later. What do your slides actually look like? Another one is this interaction piece. So if an audience feels invisible, they feel safe and can get sleepy. <laughs> so one of the things, you know, at, in this webinar, it's harder for me because I can't make eye contact with you. I, I don't even know if you can see me. I think some of you might be able to, some might not. I'm going to assume that you can. Let people know that you're looking at them. They're not invisible. Help people feel seen. And even though that might, they might prefer not to be seen, they'd rather be quite comfortable back there hidden, if you want to keep that connection and that engagement, you have to keep the people with you. Remind them that you see them. 
ask them a question. Say, I notice you have a, a you know, it looks like you might have a question, you have a concern on, the, on your face. Ah, you, you found that funny. What was funny about that? If you have time to let people talk, let them talk by all means. And if you don't have time for that, at least make eye contact with different people. Remind them that they are visible. And this piece about confidence and humor, I want to remind you of the picture I said about the door opening. So you want your audience to keep the door open to you and your ideas. You want them to stand there and hold it open because the second they stop holding it open, that door is going to come closed because that's the default position. Our brain wants to be efficient and save energy. So people are much more likely to hold open a door for an interesting, funny, confident person. Now, I know you can't just go out there and become a confident person. One thing you can do, though, is manage your inner critic. We all have it. No matter how confident a person seems, even Oprah Winfrey has a little inner critic, this little devil in our ear telling us, oh, that was stupid, oh, you're too slow, oh, you're too boring, you're too fast. What? Who knows what it is? Everyone's inner critic says something different to them. But that is the most important thing to manage if you want to stand up and be confident in front of the room. Confidence is a topic that I find very fascinating. As you know, Becky, that was a whole piece when I, when I was doing the presentation back in Berlin. And please feel free to reach out to me if you guys have any additional questions about confidence or any other topics, by the way. How do you manage that inner critic? You notice it. You're not going to get rid of it, maybe. It's been with you your whole life. But the, the most important thing is to recognize, wait a minute, there's my inner critic. I'm, I, I don't need that right now. I don't have to pay attention. Because if you don't notice your inner critic, it just talks to you saying, oh, that was stupid or slow, and you kind of obey and make yourself smaller and feel worse about yourself. If you don't realize it's your inner critic, you just feel it. But if you say, oh, there's that critic, I'm just going to push that aside and keep going. I'm going to decide to believe in myself. I'm going to decide to believe I'm doing a great job and the people in this room are interested. I'm just going to decide to believe that. I don't know if it's true or not and make a decision. So, great. Tika, thank you for the input that you can see me. <laughs> Hopefully that helps also keep your filters down if you realize there's a, there's a human being desperate for your attention on the other end of the camera. Okay. <laughs> Here is a chance, something that I recommend. Give people a chance to stop for a second and digest what you just said. So write down for yourself one thought that you have or a question you have, whether it be in the chat box or just for your own personal learning. Take a minute now to think about what's one new insight you've had so far and write it down. Great. Some people are sharing with the, with the group. Other people are sharing for themselves. If you're willing to share with the group your thoughts and questions, that will also <coughs> enhance the other people's learning. So that's great if you can do that. I think somebody might be in a cafe. I hear some background noise again. It's all possible to use and stuff. That would be fantastic. Okay. So we're going to keep moving, and I have a, a question that, that Megan wrote. She asked, does humor work for me, women and men differently? And uh, humor in different cultures is a, yeah, that's, it's not an easy one. And the, the, I, I won't go too far of a tangent into the humor piece, but I think the most important thing is don't try to be funny. I think that that <laughs> can lead you down a dangerous path. What I would say is don't refrain from being funny. I, I don't know, it's a, it's a very subtle distinction, but I think that, and, and this is what happens to me, I love a, a laugh. I love laughing with my friends. And what I used to do in the beginning of my career was I would come on stage and become professional and, and feel the need to be very serious all the time. And that was not helping me. You know, that talk about filters going up. 
So it's not that I'm trying to be funny or humorous. I'm just not refraining from being a little bit, you know, less serious sometimes, letting my own persona personality out. So don't raise the bar too high for yourself and say, I have to be funny. That, I mean, that's really a difficult task. And it's something that I learned in improv theater. If any of you are serious about getting fantastic at presentation skills, go out and take an improv course. It's the best practice you can do. And one of the things they tell you is don't try to be funny. The funniest improv things are just when people have the most random thoughts come out and that's what ends up being funny. So key takeaway, don't try to be funny, but don't stop yourself from letting whatever natural humor you have come out. Don't take yourself so seriously. I think that's the, the key. Um, and for sure it works differently for, for women and men, but I, I think it's only dangerous when people are trying to be funny that that gets dangerous. Humor in different cultures, again, that, that is a, a, a difficult one to go down. Um, but if you're not telling jokes, you know, if you're not like going out there and telling jokes, it's a lot safer. If you're just seeing the humor and what you have to say and not taking yourself too seriously, it's kind of a light touch of humor that can be really helpful without falling into those pitfalls of jokes. All right. Next step, your tools. Which tools do you have available to you no matter where you are doing what presentation? You always have these three tools. Yourself, your equipment, and your audience. Now the question is, are you using those things to your advantage or are you letting those things hinder you? And are you using those things to build connection or are those things creating blocks between yourself and your audience and, and encouraging the filters to go up? So it's just about being really conscious about what you're doing. So you have yourself. Now, how much of the room should you take up when you're presenting in front of me? Think about that. How much of a space should you take up? Should you keep yourself in a quadrant? Should you be taking up the entire room? Or should you just be, you know, make sure you're on stage? It's a whole other question. So, I, I mean, the, my own answer is make sure that the person in the very back row feels you, feels your presence, right? you actually should take up the whole room. Because you're on stage, you're the presenter. This is not the time to be shy or humble. I used to say, I know Americans, we can be uh, less than, than humble, but now is your chance. Swing out a little bit. Chances are you're not being over. Most people refrain too much. Give yourself a chance to take up more room than you normally would. Because, like I said, chances are you're, you're, you think it's too much and it actually is okay. So how do you take up the room? What am I talking about? Well, with the volume of your voice, and of course, the range of the volume, as I said before by Tika, it's not about yelling the whole time. It's about having a variety, keeping people paying attention because there's a change. There's dynamics. Your energy. If I walk into the room like this and say, okay, I'm going to be your presenter today. Um, yeah, I hope you like it. It's not going to help much. Your job is to energize your audience, whether you like it or not. <laughs> whether you like it or not. Your point is you want to get information from your head into their head, and that requires a huge amount of energy. Think about electricity being passed. You need a, a cable. You need to have Wi-Fi. Somehow you have to get that information across, and you're going to need power to do that. So do whatever it takes for yourself to make sure that you have that energy. You know, for example, I could have sat down here today. I, it would have been fine just to sit here. You probably wouldn't have noticed the difference uh, visually, but I'm standing because it's much easier to exude energy. I have to do even more because you're, you know, I can't see you and you're sitting in front of computers with lots of tempting other devices to distract you. You can take up the room with the movement. You can use up the whole space, right? The way you walk, your gait, can, can create, can take up space. Your mood, are you in a good mood? Do you seem like you're annoyed to be here? Ask yourself, what, what do you need to do to get over your nervousness enough to make it seem like you're happy to be on stage? Some people trap themselves in their nervousness and their inner critic takes over so much that they can't even show happiness to be there, to, the, to express the privilege that it is to be in front of an audience. And finally, confidence. And I don't mean ego. It's not about 
pretending you're better than other people, but it's just about, like I said before, deciding to believe that you're the best person to be in front of this room sending this information. Might not be true, but you need to decide to believe that if you want to feel confident in front of the room. You need to decide to believe those people are interested in what I have to say. Whether or not it's true, it's going to serve you to hold that belief for your, at least the length of your presentation. Then afterwards, you can ask for feedback, and it may, you, know, you may have to learn that actually there are some things you need to change about it, and that's great. You need to learn and continue, but while you're giving the talk, don't start criticizing yourself. Just decide to believe in yourself. Sounds easy. I know I'm making it sound easy, but it, you can really do this with practice. Still with me? You guys still there? Feel free to uh, write it in the chat. All right. Good. We will have uh, lapel microphones or fixed ones. Good question. I, I think I had a lapel microphone so I could move around. I'm pretty sure I insisted on that one. Um, but that's a question from Becky afterwards. Great question, obviously. So, second one, equipment. Speaking of equipment, lapel microphone, these are things, are you using them to your advantage or are they getting in your way? And it's a, it's a really delicate thing. Yeah, equipment, it's so easy to let it derail you. You know, we were doing the practice run for this webinar and I said, oh cool, there's a polling function. I think I'm gonna use that. Maybe I'll have them do this and that. And I decided, you know what, keep it simple. I want my equipment to help and enhance and not create problems, right? Unless you've tested something over and over and over again and you feel really familiar with it and comfortable with it, less is more. Do yourself a favor, keep it simple. Do your tests, go to that AV room, you know, beforehand that Becky talked about. Go there and test your stuff at least once, if not twice. Might as well, it's gonna, it's gonna save you a lot of headaches later. And a lot of you said that in the survey beforehand. How do you deal with technical stuff? Unfortunately, there's no guarantees, but test, test, test familiarize, do lots of different uh, combinations of, of testing with different computers, different rooms, as much as you can before you get there. If you have a small group, maybe even get rid of the slides, just use flip charts. Filter, just revving up the Beamer itself raises people's filters. So if possible, you can just use flip charts if it's a small group. Simple, simple slides, not too much animation, Having pictures is fantastic because that's how our brain remembers things. And here's the most important piece. Are you listening? Most important piece about equipment, your slides. Your slides should be an enhancement to what you have to say, not a crutch. What I see over and over again is people need to have their slides for themselves just to remember what they were going to say. And if the slide machine doesn't work, they're totally out of luck. So, if you are competing with your own slides for the audience's attention, you found yourself in a trap. Make sure that those slides are really an enhancement to what you have to say, helping the audience have some clarity, and it's not the whole story. I highly recommend you have two different presentations, actually. One that you use in front of the audience, and one that you send out either as pre-reading or post-reading, and my corporate clients, they put everything in the slide deck so that it can be totally standalone, that they wouldn't even have to stand there and talk about them because all of the information is in there. I think that's fine to have that slide deck do the work, but don't use that when you're in front of them. Use that as a kind of takeaway or pre-reading. Good. Questions, concerns? Type them in the chat box. The third tool that you always have at your fingertips, and it can either be an enhancement or a hindrance, is the audience itself. Stay connected with them. You know, make sure that they're with you. I, I, like I've done with you, I'm just hoping, yeah, I say, are you with me? I'm hoping you're there. Do, when you have the people in front of you, remind them that they're not invisible. Remind them that you, see, you do see them. It's very easy for people to put themselves in movie theater mode where they're at the cinema and they feel like it's just a film playing. Presentation is very different than a film. Remind them that this is not about what you have to say, it's about how much they get from what you have to say. And that's your job in front of the room. Not just to talk, but to make sure people grasp it. 
to keep those filters down. And the main way to do that is to keep the filters down. Let people keep you on track. You know, if you're sidetracking too much or you're delaying too much, you'll start to see people wandering off. It's visible when filters go up. People start yawning, they start looking at the ground, they start taking their phones, they start chatting with the person next to them. There's all sorts of information they're sending, even if they don't speak to you with, you know, a question or a concern. You can just pay attention to them and don't ignore those signals. I think a lot of people, when they're nervous, would just rather not deal with that, like, oh God, I know I'm losing them, and they just let the inner critic say, oh, you're losing your audience, you're losing your audience, but they don't take action. In that moment, stop. Take a pause. Maybe ask a question. Are you guys following me? Does anybody have any concerns? Do you guys have a question over there? The two of you are chatting. Is there something that I, I can help you with? Feel free. I mean, it's not an audience of 10,000, although if it is, then okay, maybe it's a different story. But when you're at Cornet, you're probably going to have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Becky, between 10 and 100 people in the room. Even if it's 100 people, you can still say, so, are you, question over there? Anybody, what about you guys back there? How are you doing? You know, keep, let them make sure they know that they're visible. Let them build a new connection in their brain. We already talked about that before. When I gave you the chance to write down a question, you might have noticed there's this picture on the slide. It was actually neurons. When a person learns something new, a new connection is formed in their brain. However, when that connection is first formed, the, the connection is kind of faint. It's not strong yet. That's why you, you learn something, let's say, a new vocabulary word in a foreign language. You hear it one time, you may remember, but chances are you'll forget it unless you repeat it a few times. That's because the connection needs to be uh, strengthened. It's like a path in the forest. If there's no path and it's just leaves on the ground, the first time you walk over those leaves, you turn around, you can't even see where you walked. If you walk over that same exact track hundred times, you'll start to see where you walk. The path becomes more strengthened. And it's exactly the same thing in your brain when you learn something new. You give your audience the chance to build that connection. Think about, if you give them the idea, they make the first connection. Give them a chance to think about what they just learned. The, the connection gets stronger. Give them a chance to chat with other people about what they just learned. It gets even stronger. Give them a chance to write about what they just learned. It gets even stronger. So think about what's happening in the brains of your audience. Your job is to get the message across to them. It's not just to talk. When the energy is getting low in the room, encourage exchange and asking questions. Um, and always be focused on getting those filters down. Never forget about the filters. Ask yourself, and you might even make a note for yourself, have I paid attention to the filters or not? So, a few words about virtual presentations doing my best here, to grab your attention, keeping your slides simple, making the most of your voice. Now, I, I'm afraid about my volume here. I would do a lot more playing around with the, the dynamics of my voice, but I understand that you, can, you can't hear me that well. So I'm, I'm speaking much more uniformly loud than I normally would. But when you have a great microphone, take the chance to speak quietly and loudly. Thank you for the vote of confidence, Megan. She reminded us, and we're still there. Good. Group agreements. That was something that I made a small attempt to do in the very beginning. Um, if you have a small enough audience and you know that everybody is familiar with the software and they can interact with the chat, I recommend that you ask people to say, what do we want to agree to in this web webinar? For example, we want to agree to do single tasking. We want to agree to keep our microphones on mute. We want to, you know, those kinds of things. Having people, I know it goes without saying in a way, but having people say it out loud anyway really strengthens the chance that they'll do it. Eliminate your own distractions. I, you know, as best as I can, I turn off all the notifications on all my devices. Do yourself a favor. If possible, use a moderator. You know, that's, that's great. It's been great having Becky there. You know, she can, she can mute things, she can do this, she can do that. Um, that's really, really helpful. Don't underestimate the, the power of just knowing there's somebody else there to help with technical stuff. Interact often. You know, it's much, like I've been trying to do is getting you to play around, use the chat box as much as possible, and like I said before, stand up. Go ahead. Make a new connection. Write down one thought or new question that you have, either for yourself, privately, or in the chat box.
and then we'll move on to the last piece in 30 seconds. So hopefully you've captured one uh, one thought about the tools you have yourself, your equipment, and your audience. Tika wrote a great question. Would the audience be annoyed if you asked them to stand up for a second? Who cares if they're annoyed? It's a great idea. It'll get their filters down. Even if somebody's annoyed, that means their filters down. <coughs> Pardon me. I'm going to get a little bit of water. I ran out. You gotta do what you gotta do. <clears throat> Any good tips on handheld mic use? Make sure it's close to your mouth. I think the danger is that people start talking like this and get comfortable, and they lose the volume. Make sure it's close to your mouth. And it's kind of, you know, it can be nice. It gives you something to do with your hands. Take it as an advantage. All right. <clears throat> Moving right along. We just have 10 minutes left. Get most of this. Make sure you don't have any distractions. Go back to multitasking. Here we go. Answering difficult questions. I would love to hear, if you have them fresh in your mind, some of the most difficult questions you have been asked as a presenter. <coughs> Let's type them into the chat box if you can think of them. What I hear often is questions about data that I haven't prepared or <clears throat> questions that, you know, put me on the spot as far as my own experience or my own credibility. Yeah, exactly. So some, if somebody asks you specific data points, like Vietnam residential, I guess, that'd be, oh, okay, sorry, that's um, something that I'm not familiar with. But I, yeah, thank you for the example. Exactly. When people are asking us things that we don't have the answer to and we're in front of the the whole audience, what happens? It's like we're a deer in the headlights. You know, all of a sudden we freeze, we don't know what to do, our brain actually stops working properly. The reason why it gets so difficult in those moments is because our brain is no longer functioning the way that it normally does because we're triggered. And what happens with triggering? It's the exact same thing as when we're getting attacked by a lion or a physical threat. This, our brain responds in the same way to social threats that it does to physical threats. It shuts down. So what happens when you're nervous on stage and you feel like you're going to be judged? You have higher heart rate, higher blood pressure, sweaty palms, shaky fingers. Same thing when you almost get hit by a car. It's the exact same physiological, uh, sorry, physiological response. Why? It's because the body says, now is not the time to think, it's the time to fight or run. So it's sending all the blood to the large muscle groups, away from the small muscle groups, and on purpose, <clears throat> your brain blocks the functioning of your prefrontal cortex. Why? Because it says, don't stop and build a plan and be logical, just go, just do, just fight. Unfortunately, that brain response, although it was useful back in caveman times when we were actually fighting lions and tigers, that exact same response is what happens when we're in the boardroom or when we're presenting. And there's five specific kinds of things that tend to trigger us. We tend to want to have a sense of relatedness, that we are part of a group. We want to have fairness. We want to have some certainty, some idea of what's coming in the future. <clears throat> we want to have the feeling that we're in control of our destiny, so our autonomy. And we want to have the correct amount of status. So when any of these things come into question, our brain may get triggered, and that's when we have those responses like I was talking about. Um, there's a lot more to be said about this. David Rock, uh, I can highly recommend his writings about this. I'm not going to continue right now because we have a question of time, but again, if you have, 
If you're fascinated by this, please reach out to me. I'd be happy to share more. So what do you do when you are triggered? If that does happen, how can you actually stay cool in that moment? And there's, I just want to share a few tips of what I do personally. Expect the unexpected. Going back to my point about improv class being the best presentation skill training. We all have a, a great plan. This is a quote that I like to share from the very wise philosopher uh, Mike Tyson, the boxer. He said, a plan is great until you get punched in the face. Now, something to be said for that. We go up, we think we know what we're going to say, we have prepared ourselves for questions, and then that strange question comes up and we are not prepared. If we expect the unexpected and we already feel okay about not having all the answers, somehow that helps us stay cool in the hot seat. We, we say, okay, you know, we didn't expect to have a problem with the mute button or we didn't expect to need a glass of water halfway through. And just accept that. Be okay with those unexpected things. Actually, I would say the most important thing, don't forget to breathe. If you notice that you're short of breath, that you're having, you know, shaky fingers and sweaty palms, that means your body has sent out that adrenaline expecting you needing to fight or, fl or flee. So do whatever it takes to give yourself a chance to breathe. One way is pausing. Pausing, as we said before, is already a good chance to get the audience's attention back to slow it down. And also, yeah, it gives you a chance to breathe. You let people talk amongst themselves. Meanwhile, you get a chance to breathe. You say, audience, we're going to stand up for a second. It's like a, in American baseball, seventh inning stretch. Time to stand up and stretch. You get a chance to breathe. The only thing that's going to get your system back online, get that prefrontal cortex functioning again, is if those adrenaline and other hormones, cortisol, get metabolized back in your system. And the only thing you can do to accelerate that is breathing more. <sighs> Don't forget to breathe. So, uh, great. I, I love there's some questions coming in here, some ideas about what to do. <clears throat> uh, and I'm going to get to exactly what you're saying about not making up uh, answers. So embracing silence, the reason why I put embrace silence is what I see a lot, the hard question comes in and people feel the need to answer immediately. You don't have to answer immediately. Time feels much longer to you than it does to the audience. So you get the question, say, hmm, let me think about that. Well, here's my answer. That's perfectly reasonable. Allow yourself time to think. Give yourself a chance to get to a better answer. The audience will be fine if they have to wait four seconds. Be honest and confident. So what Peter's saying <clears throat> and Sean are saying, it's okay to get back to the person later if you don't have the data. Don't make up an answer if you don't know it. By all means, be honest. Say, you know what, that is a great question. I'm going to get back to you on that. You can be honest and confident. You don't have to say, oh, I don't know the answer to that. Damn, sorry. You know, you can say, hey, you know what? I don't have that. I'm going to come back to you. And deepen the learning. So going into what, you know, what else needs to be learned? Where did that question come from? Try to understand what, what needs to be, under, you know, what needs, what's behind the question. This is what's the concern is another way of doing that. So if somebody asks a question about, um, <clears throat> you know, for example, I, I, I didn't have the answer for you right away, or I didn't take the time to talk about the difference in humor between men and women and the impact, right? So if I had time, what I would do is say, let's talk about that. Let's take a chance to deepen the learning. Apparently there's something here that we can all, there's some curiosity in the room around the gender differences in humor. Let's talk about that more. So if you're willing to improvise and expect the unexpected, you potentially could find some really rich, interesting information by deepening the learning. The other thing you can do in that same example from earlier about, you know, what's the difference humor of men and women, is say, so that question's coming from somewhere. Tell me, what's the concern behind? You know, what, where, what, are, you, what are you worried is going to happen, or what do you need that's making you ask that question? So even if I don't have the answer to the question that was asked, I may have an answer to how to handle the concern that was behind the question. Most questions 
have a concern behind. And if you have the courage to ask about that and to create a safe enough atmosphere that the person can talk to you about that, then you're really going to make much more interesting conversations and deepen the learning. So I'm just going to take a second to read what's happening in the chat box. There's a lot of activity. It says, the audience barracks for a speaker who gets put on the spot. They want you to recover. They will cut you slack. Yeah, and sometimes they will try to help you. Exactly. Thank you, Peter. You have your audience as a tool. People want to help out and feel free to open the question up to everyone. Say, you know what? I'd be really interested. We have a room of professionals here. What are the other things? This is really a great chance to exchange knowledge. And also you can get a skills panel on stage with you and hand it off to them. Co-leading is also a great thing to do. So there's all sorts of tips here, and I recognize I'm going fast. It's 10 o'clock. I'm going to keep moving. What to avoid? Just don't feel like you're being attacked. Don't take it personally because you're not going to be at your best. Avoid saying negative things about others like, oh, I didn't get the information from the other department, so I don't have that. Oh, don't, you know, I don't have that answer. If you cross your legs or feet, you're somehow throwing yourself off balance. You want to be, like I said, honest and confident. Keep yourself grounded and balanced physically. Surprisingly, that has an impact of how grounded and balanced you are emotionally and mentally. Just try it. Avoid immediately answering. Get the question, give yourself a chance to think, and then respond. And avoid being defensive. So what I mean by that is avoid explaining why you don't have the answer to the question. Nobody really cares. Just either 